Right, seems like it's one o'clock and that means it's time to start. Hello everybody. Um, my name is Anga. Pleased to meet all of you. And today uh, we are, uh, this is uh, a short session on uh, part of the Culture Connects Us uh, series of online uh, events. And today we're going to be looking at preparing for IELTS from home. So I, I see there's already quite a few participants um, already in the, in, in the session. And um, if you have any questions, do feel free to plop them into the question and answer uh, bit down in the bottom. So on the bottom, you should be able to see a bit which has a Q&A. If you have any questions, you can put them on there. The chat, leave it for things that you just want to talk about uh, in general. Okay. So. 
Um, before we start, you should know that we are going to be recording this session. Um, just make sure that, um, what do you call it? Um, you should know that by attending the session, uh, your image and comments may be recorded and be rebroadcast. Um, if you'd rather not, that means it's probably best if you, if you were to leave. Uh, but also at the end of the session, please don't forget um, to uh, fill in the questionnaire that we'll be sending out to you, okay? We really appreciate any of the feedback that you could give us, okay? So, um, let's begin. Remember, if you have any questions, just put them in the uh, question and answer uh, panel underneath at the bottom of the toolbar, and let's just get started, shall we? Okay, so today's session is we're going to look at preparing for IELTS from home. And my name's Anga. I'm um, the academic manager for, um, uh, for British Council Indonesia. Uh, I've been a, a language teacher for, oh God, for it seems like a long time, since uh, the mid-2000s. And I've been um, in Jakarta for a few years now. And um, yeah, uh, I've been doing IELTS preparation for, for about, oh God, for, it seems it's 10 years that I've been doing this. So um let's uh that's a little bit about me and let's just quickly begin shall we all right so what we are going to be talking about today when uh talking about preparing for ielts at home we'll be looking at a few different things number one uh the first thing we'll be talking about is do you know if you're ready to prepare for ielts so that's the first question you're going to be able to answer today is to know if you're ready to prepare for it the second thing you're going to find out is um, you'll know how to best prepare for your IELTS. Now that means we're looking at different uh, specific ways that you can prepare from home to ensure that when you do your IELTS, you'll get the best results you can. Also, we'll, uh, I'll be sharing links and um, useful study resources for things you can do from home. Um, and at the end, uh, I'll be answering questions that you may have. But you don't have to wait until the Q&A session to actually write your questions. Uh, if, any, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to just, again, plop them into the Q&A part below. Um, you should see it on the bottom of your screen. Make sure you ask there, and at the end, we'll have some time to uh, discuss any of your questions. Okay, so first of all, I'd like you to just, in the chat, right, I'd like you to answer a few questions, yeah? So the first thing we're going to do is we want to, I want to know a little bit about your own needs and your own abilities. So um, in the chat, I'd like you to just type in your answers, yeah? Uh, let us know why you need to take the IELTS, when you need to take it, and what band score you need. Um, so go ahead and um, start putting those in uh, because all of these things will affect um, how you should prepare for the IELTS, yeah? Um, one of the big things is um, when you're looking at the, uh, when you're looking at preparing, one of the key important things is to make sure that you know exactly uh, where you are and uh, what you need to achieve so you'll be able to, to bridge that gap. So uh, those three questions, yeah? Uh, why you need to take it, when you need to take it, and what band, just type it in, right? Okay, so I've got a few answers already. Um, studying abroad, okay, around August, September this year, Zafira says, and a minimum of 7.0. So that's good. These are the questions, Zafira, that you need to answer for yourself. You need to know these things. Um, so make sure you do know these things, okay? Um, just keep putting them into the chat, uh, everyone, and um, uh, this will kind of change the things that I will be talking about later on. Ooh, oh, it looks like Rio has got some, uh, quite a long time to prepare. He's planning on doing the IELTS in 2022. So that's good, you're here super early to prepare for that. Okay, cool, cool, cool. All right, so um, keep putting them in and I'll be uh, commenting on them as we go along. Okay, so uh, oh, it seems like everyone needs the same thing. Everyone wants to just study abroad. Uh, probably next year. Okay, so uh, let's have a look into what you need to know, yeah? So, um, the first thing you should know, yeah, and this is, this is for real, right? 
the first thing you should know is you should only take an IELTS if you need it. If you're here because you have no idea, you just want to know about IELTS, this is not for you. The main reason why you should take an IELTS is because you need it, yeah? Um, and the reason why you should take uh, the IELTS is only because the university that you're applying to or the institution that you're applying to actually require you to get an IELTS. For everything else, you don't need to do an IELTS, yeah? Make sure that you need to do it, okay? This is the first thing you need to know, right? Because when it comes to preparing for IELTS, you can't just prepare for it just like that. It takes a lot of time because there are two things that you need to prepare for. Number one is the test taking preparation. This means we're looking at um, your, your test skills themselves, right? So this means knowing what the test is like. This means knowing what will be expected of you from the writing test, from the speaking test, from the reading and the listening, all the skills and strategies that you need, right? The other thing you need to kind of think about right, is the language preparation. Now, at the end of the day, yeah, um, the IELTS test is a direct test of your abilities to use English, oh, sorry, not speaking, to use English in a, an academic environment, because I'm assuming most of you are here because you want to take uh, further studies abroad, at least according to the chat it is, right? And that means uh, it's not just about uh, doing a test. It's actually about improving your English first. That is what's key in IELTS. And that is something that I find in Indonesia because Indonesians are so used to the whole, um, you know, after school class, after school uh, course type of thing. Uh, and if all you're looking for is to pass a test, you prepare by going to a language course and preparing for like two or three months. But that's not normally what most people need when they're preparing for an IELTS. Yeah, it'll take much longer. I will talk about that a little bit uh, in the future. But make sure that there are these two things that you, you, you want to focus on when you're preparing for IELTS. Okay, and this then comes into how much preparation do you really need? Okay, so this of course will depend, but. The main thing is, if you've not done any sort of preparation at all, before you do anything else, yeah, the first thing you need to do is find out what band score you need. Now, most of you in the chat have already showed me that, okay, you need a six, you need a seven. Some people even need a 7.5 or an eight, yeah? So this is the first thing you need to do. Find out what band score you need. And the next thing you need to do is find out if you can already get it, yeah? Because most, there, there are people who kind of don't really need to prepare for the IELTS if their educational background and their ability already um, is appropriate for it, then you don't really need to do a lot of preparation. You can just do the test. So first thing you need to do is actually do a legitimate practice test. So here I've got three links that you can go to. Now, these links are simply the links from, what do you call them? These are simply links from the legitimate places. Now, why do I call them legitimate places? Is because the IELTS, if you don't know already, is owned by three organizations. The three organizations are uh, IDP Australia, British Council, as well as Cambridge Assessments, right? So here there are three links that you can go to where you can find actual real life uh, IELTS tests from the past. So the first thing that you should do is do a legitimate practice test and go to those three organizations. Yeah. If you just Google um, practice test IELTS online, you don't know where those tests come from and you don't know the legitimacy of it. So I would, eh, eh, I would recommend against that and make sure you're, you're, you're doing, um, you, 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 you make sure you're doing a practice test from a reliable source, okay? And those sources are, if you missed them, IDP Australia, British Council, that's us, as well as Cambridge um, Assessments. Those are the three places you should go to. Okay, so you've you found out the legitimate practice test, and what you need to do is you need to do the practice tests, of course, right? So um, once you do the practice test, this is the way you can find out your ability. Now there are three ways 
or, or well, not three ways. There are uh, three levels of validity in terms of your of finding out your ability. We have the the quick and easy one, yeah, a, a good enough one, and an ideal one. So most of you need a 6.5 on the IELTS. Now this is gonna, uh, so I'm just gonna be focusing on that band for now. Um, however, um, I, I, I'll let you know a little bit more about what you'll need if you need a seven, seven and a half or an eight later on. So the best, the way to find out your ability, the quick and easy way is this, right? So do one practice test for one task. You don't have to do all of the tasks. So do, uh, task one of the reading and listening test. This should take about 15 minutes for the reading and it should take about 10 minutes for the listening. If you need a 6.5 or above, yeah, you need to get 95 to 100% of these questions right. Yeah. In, in the IELTS test, in both reading and listening, um, the first listening script and the first reading uh, passage is the easiest. And the questions are the easiest in the first uh, section as well. So if you need to get a 6.5, you need overall about 27 or 28 correct. And that uh, out of 40. So that means because uh, the grade of difficulty is uh, starts from very easy to hard, right? The first section, if you cannot get 95 to 100% correct, your English is probably not good enough to prepare for the IELTS directly, yeah? So try out uh, a legitimate practice test, and if you can get um, 95 to 100% correct in task one, yeah, your English is oh, maybe good enough if you can get 95 to 100% correct, okay? Now, for the good enough, what you need to do is do a full practice test for both reading and listening. If you can get over 28 correct answers, that would mean you could probably be able to get a 6.5. And that means your English is probably good enough, okay? However, this is only one test. And the thing is, uh, IELTS tests are not always the same difficulty. Now, when I say not always the same difficulty, I don't mean that um, in one test, everything is gonna be super easy. In the other test, everything is gonna be super hard. But depending on the topics, there might be a ver uh, uh, there might be some small variability in the difficulty of the um, leading of all of the tests. So sometimes you can get a six point five if you get twenty six correct. Sometimes you need twenty seven. Sometimes you need twenty eight. And that means if you only do a practice test once you might not know uh, the validity of the data is not that great. As you probably know already, the more data you have, the more, uh, the better conclusions you can draw from that data, yeah? So ideally, what you really want to do, if you have the time, is do multiple full practice tests just for reading and listening. If you can consistently get 27 out of 40 correct, in several full practice tests, that means your English is probably good enough. Yeah, probably being the main word here, because of course it does depend on uh, many factors, including if you feel good during the day. You never know. Like in the real IELTS test, you might be feeling kind of sick, and you might do actually more poorly. Or during the actual IELTS test, the topics might be about something that you're already super interested in, and you have some background knowledge. So you'll be able to get a higher score. Yeah, but what's key is the first thing you should do is always find out your ability. Yeah. Now, once you've found out your ability, yeah, what we need to look at is what is good enough. Because a lot of people I'm seeing, um, all you've got is the number. I need a six and a seven. Uh, but what actually does uh, what actually five, six band seven actually mean? Right? So when I'm talking good enough, I'm talking about a band six-ish kind of level. Now, what does that mean in real terms? Well, it's this. If you're a band five, you have partial command of the language and you can cope with overall meaning in most situations. So this means that you're able to use English okay. And for example, when you are doing, when you're um, 
becoming a tourist and you're traveling and you can deal with most situations there. You can um, order food, you can complain about your hotel and things like that. And you can do it okay, not great, but communication uh, is successful as in the other person understands what you mean. Now what band six is, you have an operational command in familiar situations. Now this means that you can already start working in English. Yeah? If you have a band six, that means you're already kind of good enough to uh, use English day to day at work for most of your working uh, tasks. So, um, you know, like asking a colleague when the next meeting is, uh, participating in, 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 in more general topics of meetings and stuff like that. Uh, however, band seven is you have an operational command and you, have an underst you can understand detailed reasoning. This is where you're starting to become more fully able to participate in work, uh, work meetings or when you're more better suited to um, understanding academic language. And for most of you, right, um, if you're looking for an undergraduate degree, a 6 or a 6.5 is usually enough. For postgraduates, like master's degrees, and for even for undergraduates at the very, very top universities like Oxford or Harvard, you might be uh, required to get a band 7. Yeah, But then again, some of you might only be interested in doing like um, a culinary course, for example. And I know that there are culinary courses in Australia that accept a 5.5 or a 6. So what is good enough? Well, it depends on your um, it depends on your goals and your aims and what the university requires of you. But also, yeah, you should know what band six actually means. And this is where you can reflect on yourself, think about it, and be brutally honest with yourself. Is my English actually good enough to understand most um, conversations at work? Uh, for familiar topics? Am I able to communicate my ideas clearly? If not, you're not there yet and your English is probably not good enough as well, right? This is something that you need to be able to identify yourself as well, okay? And once you've got that, you can do a quick practice test. Like this is an example, yeah? Uh, you can fight, I, I swear to God, there's so many um, IELTS uh, practice tests from actual good places like this place is, it's from IELTS.org. So it's literally from the people who make it. So do that, yeah, as soon as you can, if possible, yeah? Oh, uh, actually, let's skip this. We don't really have time. But you should try it and see if you have your answers, if, if, if you can get most of the answers yourself. So once you've done a practice test, the next thing is you know, what's next, right? You know what you need to do. You've done the practice test. You can kind of guess your ability already. What should you do now? Well, if your English is good enough, well, that's relatively simple. If you're able to get 95, 100% correct on the reading or listening task one, your next thing is to decide on a computer delivered IELTS or the paper and pen one. Now you might have heard about this, but uh, there's now computer delivered IELTS where instead of writing, you're typing. Now, this will depend on you. I mean, me personally, I do not want to do a paper and pen one because my writing is horrible. Nobody is able to read my writing. And to be honest, the examiners, they're humans too. So if they, if they see your writing and your writing is poor, they might not want to, you know, uh, they will find it difficult to read your writing. So it's going to be a little bit harder for them to give you the, the, the score that you actually deserve, right? However, there are some disadvantages to it as well. But basically, this is something that you should consider. Yeah? First, you need to decide on that. Right? The next thing is you need to find a course that finishes at least two months before your IELTS deadline. So, for example, um, we've got, uh, let's see. So, for example, here we've got Chitra Ashila, who wants to study abroad in 2021. So probably intake in 2021, if you're going to the UK, intake is in September. So that means you'll need to get everything into the university by August at least. That means your course should end at least 
Yeah, at the very latest, it should end around June. Why do you need a two month lead time? Well, however much you prepare on the test, you might not actually do as well as you wanted or as well as you need. So you might have to actually redo the test. That's why we recommend finishing a course at least a few months beforehand, so before the deadline, so you're fully, um, you're fully um, prepared for it. Because if you need to do it now, if you need to do the test now and you're not prepared, it's kind of too late. Yeah? You need to figure out, uh, you need to prepare as soon as possible. If you're, even if your English is good enough, you need to prepare because those, those, um, there are test taking strategies that if your English is good enough, but you don't know the test taking strategies, you will lose marks. Yeah. So make sure you plan well, well, well in advance. Okay. So, um, if there's any questions, make sure you put it in the Q and A. Yeah. Right now. I've got um, two questions, which we will get to at the end, yeah? But if you have any questions about this, make sure to put it in the Q&A box. All right. Yeah. Right. So now comes to, the, this is going to be the longer part of the session, which is if your English is not good enough, what should you do then? Well, it's simple. If your English is not good enough, start learning English in general. Don't even start think, don't even think about doing IELTS preparation just yet because you're going to be so, you're going to have too much information. You won't be able to process it that you won't be able to develop your English in general. Yeah. So when we're talking about preparing for English in general, why should we do it? The main reason is this. Okay. Have a read of this. Okay. According to experts, Students struggle with these kinds of exams because they have difficulties understanding the content of the test. The content, right? Basically, what this means is people fail IELTS not because they don't have the test taking skills. You might have all the test taking skills, but it's kind of useless if you don't understand the reading, if you don't understand the listening, yeah? Because you don't fail because you don't have the test taking skills. You fail because you don't understand what is said on the test. You don't understand the vocabulary in the test. You don't understand the structures. You don't understand the instructions sometimes because you don't understand the English. Uh, when the examiner speaks to you in the speaking test, you don't understand the questions that are given to you and you don't understand and you don't know how to communicate your ideas. Because even though your English might not be great, I have no doubt that all, every single one of you are smart people and you have great ideas, right? But the thing that's going to bring you down isn't your lack of ideas or your lack of test taking skills. It's your lack of ability in translating that idea from your head into words that the examiner can understand. Okay. So this is key. Yeah. The first way you should, uh, you should try to think about developing your IELTS ability is developing your general English ability. I know it sounds weird, but that's what the research suggests. So the next question then comes is how long will it take for you to be fully prepared if your English isn't good enough? Well, of course, it depends on your current ability and your goal, right? Now, According to research, um, it can take up to 200 hours of guided learning to go up one band in IELTS. Now, what that means is that you, there, it can take 200 hours of learning with a teacher to go up one band. And this is not about test taking skills. This is about English language ability in general. So you think about 200 hours and you go, oh my God, that's way too long. That's too much. And you know what? I agree with you. 200 hours of learning with a teacher is a lot. And I don't think anyone really has enough time for that. So what are some ways we can speed it up? Yeah? So if we want to speed it up, there are loads of ways. And this is where we start the main ideas of uh, this webinar. So what should you do? Well, the first thing is um, language immersion. Now, I'll, we'll be talking about that later. That's number one. Number two is self-study materials. Three are MOOCs. Uh, we'll We'll look into all of these later on. And the final one is, of course, online classes. So first of all, let's talk about language immersion. Okay, so research suggests that being exposed to your target language 
and then using it is more beneficial than learning using traditional methods. So basically this, let me translate into that into simple words. It basically means research suggests that reading, listening, and watching, to, watching things in English and then talking to other people and writing in English to other people is actually more beneficial than studying with a teacher. Seriously. Now, I know this for a fact because I grew up in Australia. My first language is actually English. I myself am Indonesian and when I came back to Indonesia, all I could say, I could only say Nama saya Angga and Rumah saya di Jalan Kalimantan. Those were the only two sentences I could actually say in Bahasa, right? But after just one year of living in Indonesia, because my mom and dad stopped speaking to me in English and I was put into a school which used Bahasa, that was the language I heard every day. That was the language that I had to use every day. And even though it was really difficult, after a year, I was able to actually follow most of what was happening at school. I was actually started to be able, I actually started to be able to learn using Bahasa, right? And, and, and having been here now for, you know, decades now, um, now I can actually speak Bahasa really well. If you and I, we met on the street, um, you would not even guess that my first language is not Indonesian because, I speak Indonesian very, very fluently now. And that is the, the, the key to language immersion. But of course, we don't all have the luxury of moving to a country which uses the language. We're in Indonesia, it's an Indonesian speaking country, so what can you do? Well, the first thing you can do, and the one that I recommend the most is reading. However, books are expensive to buy, especially English books in Indonesia, right? So what can you do? Simple openlibrary.org. This is a free resource with hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of free books that you can read, okay? So go to this place and read uh, whatever, yeah? Read as much as you can. And don't read things that are useful or um, helpful for you to study. Yeah? Read things that are interesting. If you read things that are interesting to you, you would want to read more. And the more you read, the more of structure, the more vocabulary um, that you learn, right? So read is number one. Okay, um, Ranga, I see you put a question in the chat. Can you please put it in the Q&A later so we don't lose it? Okay, Ranga, um, I, we will get to that later, yeah? Thank you. Okay, so the first thing is read, all right? Um, other resources you can read for reading, um, of course, because I work for British Council, here are some British Council materials. Uh, you can simply Google this by going to Learn English, uh, British Council Reading. Now, at the end of this, I'll be sending all of you a PDF with a summary of uh, the tips today. So you don't have to write all of this, but um, it might be useful if you want yeah, to write down some of the links if you want to but also your news app. Like everybody has on their phone an application that uh, already has news uh, from all around the world. So use that, yeah, read and read things, please. Read things that are interesting to you, yeah. Don't read something because your teacher tells you to read uh, a grammar book or read whatever. Read stuff that's interesting. Um, read comics, if that's the stuff that interests you. Like I was saying earlier, uh, Indonesian is my second language. I learned Indonesian mainly from, oh, what was that comic? It was, a, it was a Kung Fu comic, right? Oh, I forget what it was. But it was basically a Kung Fu comic and, and it was Doraemon. Those were the two comics that I read the most and that's how I started to learn Bahasa. Okay, so read is number one. And of course you should listen, yeah? Now for listening to things, it's best to use podcasts. So go to Apple Podcasts or you can go to Stitcher Radio and there are loads. Honey's got it, Kung Fu Boy, that's it. That's it, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I've got the chat open and I can see it and that's the thing. <laughs> no, but Fauzi, you're right, it is Doraemon, but it's also Kung Fu Boy. What was his name, Chin Mi? Was Chin Mi? Yeah, I think Chin Mi was his name, uh, whatever. Okay, so the, uh, go, to, go to a podcast app, yeah? Uh, you can go to Apple Podcasts if you've got an iPhone, if you're on Android, you can go to Stitcher Radio, you can go to Google Podcasts, there's loads of podcasts. 
and what podcasts are, which is quite amazing that not more Indonesians listen to podcasts, is they're basically radio shows, pre-recorded radio shows that you can listen to whenever, wherever. You download it onto your phone. And what's great about podcast apps, a lot of them have, um, you can slow down the speakers or you can, you know, make them go quicker. So if you guys are language learners, which I'm assuming all of you are, um, you can slow it down to 80% or 90% speed. So, oh, or yeah, use Spotify. Yeah, uh, Spotify also has podcasts all over the place. So use that. I personally don't use Spotify because it makes it difficult for me to, um, what do you call it? To curate the ones that I like to listen to. But yeah, podcasts on Spotify, there's loads there. So listen to podcasts and don't listen again, don't listen to things because your teacher tells you to listen to things that are interesting. If you like funny ones, listen to funny ones. If you like uh, economics, listen to economic ones. If you like the news, listen to those. If you like to read, if you, yeah, whatever it is, listen to things that you want. But also if you want to do something that's more focused on learning, well, British Council has your back as well. We've got free British Council Learn English podcasts and all of these, there are podcasts for lower level students, for intermediate students, for uh, higher level students, and they're all free. They're all free, yeah? And, and most podcasts are free as well. I mean, some of them ask for donations, but they're free. So listen to them and especially find the apps that you can slow down uh, the speed at which they speak. So, you know, it's easier for you to understand everything. So do that. Yeah, listen. The next thing is, of course, watching things. Yeah. Now, the two things that I recommend the most are YouTube education, oh, sorry, education YouTubers, as well as TED Talks. Now, the thing about TED Talks or TED Ed, which I'm a super fan of, and education YouTubers, the reason why you should watch this is because these people are trying to teach you things. And because they're trying to teach you things, they will speak using simple language. Not only will they use simple language, they'll use language that's uh, for, for a super, super wide audience. Like one of my favorite YouTubers is Tom Scott. He's an education YouTuber, um, not always super educational, sometimes funny, silly things as well, but he speaks a little bit more slowly than most YouTubers. He speaks using vocabulary that is known to most people. So again, it's easier to understand, okay? And the same thing with TED Talks or TED Ed, and especially these, because they all have closed captioning. They have subtitles. That's what's great about education YouTubers and TED Talks, guys, uh, TED Talks and TED Ed videos, is that all of the subtitles are there because they care about learning they will actually put the time and effort into putting subtitles or making sure that their closed captions are good, okay? So watch those things. But of course, if that's not what you like, use your streaming service. I know most of you probably have a Netflix or a Hulu or an iFlix or whatever. Use that, yeah? And um, yeah, watch whatever. Use English subtitles though, because if you're not using English subtitles, you're kind of missing the point. And that means if you like to watch anime, watch anime. If you like to watch um, Korean dramas, watch Korean dramas, do whatever. Just use English subtitles and this will help you. What this does, this reading, listening and watching is it helps you absorb the language. It helps you get a uh, kind of um, hear and read new vocabulary, uh, new structures, new ways of, uh, you know, um, communicating ideas and that is super key but what's more key than that is you also need to match that with using the language you need to speak you need to get into places like this and talk to people because use it or lose it basically if when you read things and watch things and you learn new things it goes into your brain right however the it's not going to stick into your brain unless you use it yeah, it's kind of useless to have input like the, the, the books that you read and everything else unless you actually use it because you will definitely forget everything. You'll forget it, I promise. So you need input and you also need output. 
where can you get this output? Where can you find people who are, um, you know, where can you find people who also want to improve their English? It's easy. There are, if you go to Google, you will find uh, WhatsApp groups that are dedicated to people practicing their English. There are Facebook groups for the same thing. Even things like this, if you go to any of the other Culture Connects Us events, you will see other people who are trying to improve their English. If you make two, three, four connections during this time, you'll be able to definitely find other people for, to, for you to practice with. Yeah, so immersion, that is key. Number one, okay? Always the best. All right, the next thing we're gonna look at is self-study materials. So self-study materials are really good, actually. But again, don't do this because you have to find something interesting, yeah? It's all about what get, gets your interest. Okay, so for self-study materials, right, there is this amazing uh, website, the BBC Learning English website. It has a lot of materials. And what's great is that um, they're taken from real life news sources. So you're learning real life English, right? That's great. Another good thing is, of course, British Council. We have lots of language learning apps. If you go to the App Store on uh, your iPhone, or if you go to the Google Play Store on your Android, just Google British Council apps and you'll see loads of them. There's a free one about grammar. There's a free video one. There's, uh, there's the podcast one, right? There's loads of things, okay? Look for that. You can also even look at Learn English Select. Now, these first two are free. Learn English Select is something you pay for, right? It's, it's, it's another British Council um, product. Find those things and actually use them. Yeah, it's, it's actually very useful to do. Um, also, oh, of course, Quizlet.com. Quizlet is a vocabulary, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I, I can't think. It's a, it's no, no, no cards, no cards, uh, no cards and stuff. So, you know, you have the, the word and then you flip it over and then you have the definition, but it's just digital. There's a bunch of materials already made on Quizlet for just you learning English. It's great, yeah? Use it, yeah? Uh, they're all free except for Learn English Select, but everything's good. But then again, remember, you have to use it or lose it. So even if you're doing all of this stuff, make sure you actually uh, practice using English. If you don't practice, you're gonna forget all of that language, okay? You are, you are gonna, yes, thank you. Flashcards, that's what I was thinking. Uh, thank you, Rito. I totally forgot, totally blanked that word. See, you don't use it, you lose it. All right, so make sure you actually practice it. Okay, so the other thing is trying a MOOC. Now, you might not know what a MOOC is, uh, but if you do, it's great. A MOOC is a massive online open course, and usually this is, they're made by top universities, uh, well, not just top universities, but they're made by universities all around the world, and they're usually free, right? Um, so, What's great about this is that not only are you learning a topic, like if you're, I've done a MOOC, it was about, um, uh, what do you call it? It was about world history. It was fantastic. I loved it. And not only is it something that I love that I want to learn and something that you probably want to learn for, you can also use it to improve your English because you're going to be using the English for the lectures, for the discussions, for the papers that you have to write if you need to, right? But then again, you know, um, you have this input, but you need to use it. So make sure that you're using it in the forums and in the discussions and the papers. And this means doing a MOOC can really help you improve your English as well, because you're getting new ideas, you're getting new language, and you're able to use it. And what's more, because they have discussion forums and they have uh, these communities, you'll be able to communicate and uh, you know connect with people who also want to learn English, right? So this is doubly great. Use a MOOC, right? So some uh, MOOCs you can use, you've got Udemy, FutureLearn, Coursera, edX. Uh, British Council, we have some courses on FutureLearn. If you check those FutureLearn uh, courses out, um, there are actually ones that are specifically about IELTS, yeah? But yeah, you can get stuff from a load, a load of places, like from Harvard, from UCLA, from Oxford. Um, all of those universities, yeah, they all have um, MOOC courses. So check those out. Um, again, check the PDF that I'll send to you at the end so you'll know where to get it, yeah? All right. 
And finally, we're going to look at online courses. And of course, online courses are going to help, right? But nowadays, there's a lot of people who are pushing their online courses. And the question for you guys is how do you know if it's good or not? So, um, you know, who are you going to, how are you going to assess whether or not the, the, the organizations or the companies that are selling you an online course is good or not? Here are some questions that you should ask them, okay? So if you're looking about the quality, the first thing you should uh, ask about is the quality of the teacher. Now we're looking at the qualifications and the qualifications that you wanna ask for is something called SELTA or Trinity TESOL, yeah? Look for, uh, what do you call it? Look for uh, language schools that have SELTA or Trinity TESOL qualifications. This is the standard, uh, the minimum standard that all English teachers should have either a CELTA or a Trinity TESOL um, to see if they're actually any good at teaching. Yeah. Now, trust me, I've been, I've been doing um, uh, teacher development and I've been doing uh, hiring for many years. And if they don't have these things, their quality, eh, not great, not great, not great, not great. So make sure you ask this question first. This is question number one. What are the qualifications that your teachers hold? If they cannot answer this or they do not answer this, then you know this place, eh, not great. Okay, the next thing is they have to have face-to-face -face sessions with fewer than 10 people. Now, why am I saying face-to-face -face sessions when we're doing it from home? What I mean is stuff like this. If they're selling you courses with hundreds of participants for every video or for every lesson, don't do that. Yeah, you need to have these online courses that are face to face where you can see the teacher and the teachers can see you and you can see the other students. And it has to be fewer than 10 people because anymore and you won't get enough face time with your teacher and your teacher will not know your own development. Yeah, because that is what's key. Whatever I teach you is not what's important. What's important is what you teach me. And what I mean by that is I need to know how well you understand what I taught you so I can give you personalized feedback. If I teach you, I don't know, uh, Pythagoras' theorem, for example, I teach you that and that's it, then you wouldn't have learned. If I teach you that and then you try it and I can say, oh yeah, that's actually pretty good. You're doing the right thing there. Or, oh, I see that this is the problem. You need personalized feedback, yeah? So ask, for clear, actionable feedback that can help you improve. These are the three minimum requirements that you should ask of your language learning institutions. Make sure they have that. If they don't, go somewhere else, right? Unless they're super cheap. I guess if you're super cheap, then yeah, sure, whatever, right? But if you want to have a good value for money, make sure these three things are, uh, are there. Okay, so, um, because I also work for the British Council, we've also got language learning, um, what do you call it? We have a, a, a teaching center as well. Um, you can check it out at BritishCouncilFoundation.id or our Instagram is IDLearnEnglish. Right now we have free, what you call it again? We have free trial lessons and I think they start from one and a half million the courses do, yeah? So you can check us out if you want to, um, yeah. And, and that's what you should do, right? So, when you talk about how you get better, remember the four things, language immersion, self-study, MOOCs, and online classes. Those are the four ways that you can develop and be better, all right? Because at the end of the day, if you don't use it, you lose it. You lose all of that language. Okay, I think that's basically all of the information I need to give you. So. Let's have a look at some of the questions. All right, okay, okay, okay. So let me just uh, stop my screen sharing. Okay, so we've got a question. Let's start from the first questions right at the bottom. Okay, uh, oh, hang on. Where's the questions from the top? Uh, for the screen designer, what will have an impact on the assessment? No, okay, so um, there are four requirements that they look at when you're looking for a uh, what, the four criteria, there's fluency, there's grammar, there's vocabulary, and there's pronunciation. You do not need to speak with a British accent as long as the, 
what do you call it? Examiners just look for a intelligible pronunciation, which means can you be understood um, easily? Yeah, can you be understood easily by most people? So those are the four things. Yeah. Now, if you want to get more information about that, uh, this is what you should Google. Yeah. Uh, what's it called? IELTS speaking and descriptors. Okay. So I've just put it all in the chat for the panelists for everyone. That is what you should Google uh, if you want to know uh, what will impact your assessment. But no, you don't have to speak with a British accent. Speak with an Indonesian accent and be proud of it. It's a, it's a great accent. You can use it. Okay, specific tips for writing. Oh my God, there's so many specific tips. But again, the focus is on not on finding specific uh, tips for how to improve. It's about improving your general English uh, well enough that you're able to answer the question easily. Okay, so um, don't, again, do not think about, um, do not think too much about specific tips. If you want that, you should go to an IELTS preparation course. The key takeaway from today is please, 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 please prepare for English in general. Make sure your English is good enough in general. Yeah? Okay. Uh, but some tips, but the main tip, right, is answer the question. Because some people just don't answer the question. If they ask you to do one thing, answer that. Don't talk, you know, make sure that what you're writing is relevant. That's one tip. All right. So how do we prepare for speaking? How to answer? Okay. If you're not familiar with a given question, just say so. Be honest. If somebody asks you about, um, so what do you think about, uh, how, does um, tourism affect uh, the environment? And how does the environment then, uh, you know, uh, environmental damage, does that affect tourism? And then you go, just say something like, you know what, I've actually never thought about that. I don't really know. I've never, it's not something I really think about, but I guess it might, you know, it, it might. I mean, I'm assuming. So just be honest. If you're not, if you're not, if you don't know the, if you're not familiar with the topic, be honest and just talk about uh, how you're not sure uh, about the topic. The, what they're, what they're looking for, the examiners, they're not looking for, do you understand the topic? No, they just want to know if you can communicate your ideas clearly. So yeah, don't stress if you're not familiar with the question. Just answer and be honest if you don't really know. Right. Mm, right. The Ranga's got another good question. Testing uh, function. Okay, so he's saying that uh, the score might fluctuate between the first and second test. Uh, the first test you do listening is seven, second test is 6.5. How could you maintain our score increases? Well, that's, that's a bit of a difficult question. Basically, um, you will have a range of ability. Yeah. Your ability is not one fixed point. It's actually a range. So, um, it kind of depends. Is your, is 6.5 towards the top of your range or towards the bottom of your range? Because there's a lot of, um, in exams, we call this um, test reliability. And test reliability is whether or not the same, uh, the same um, test candidate will receive the same score on the same test on a different day. The IELTS has been tested rigorous, rigorously to make sure that the reliability is high. But basically, it kind of depends on the day because on, on the first day, if you've got a really good listening score, it might be because the topic is familiar with you and you know the vocabulary. But in the next time you try it, you drop the score because you're not familiar with the vocabulary, so you can't answer the question. So that's the difficult thing. Um, the best way to make sure that your test, your test answers, uh, your, sorry, your test scores are good is again, developing your general English, yeah? Because, uh, you know, listening for today might involve something about animals. And the other day, it might be about geography. So there's, there's no real easy way to answer that. You just need to develop your English in general. Okay. 
okay, so Arangas also asked the question between uh, def main difference between writing BAM 6 and 7. There is a lot of differences, a lot of differences. Um, what you could do, right, is again, this is something you can Google. Um, sample answers and sample answers uh, writing uh, IELTS writing and then make sure you look for answers from IELTS.org. IELTS.org actually has uh, IELTS.org actually has samples of past uh, IELTS test. So we have actual students who've actually taken the test and there's actual um, comments from examiners. It's going to be so difficult for me to tell you what they are. Check that out. So again, sample answers IELTS writing and then look for it from IELTS.org. Ah, okay. Oh, Nora's got a really interesting question. Um, the most effective way of improving English is by using it every day. How do we know if what we're writing or we're speaking, how do we know if it's right? Okay, this is a super easy uh, question to answer. How do you know if it's right is if the other person can understand you. That's literally it. Now, you might then start saying, hey, Anga, what about grammatical accuracy? And I would go, yeah, grammatical accuracy is a thing, but native speakers make grammatical errors all the time, and they don't call them errors, they just call them different um, types of English. So in real terms, all you have to know, all you have to make sure of is the other person understands you. Yeah, that is key. However, on the IELTS, I can understand why people go, yeah, but Anga, they also check our grammar and vocabulary. Right? Yes, they do. But it's not just grammar and vocabulary that they're checking. In speaking, they're also looking for fluency and coherence. They're also looking at uh, pronunciation. So for example, if you need a 6.5 and your grammar and vocabulary, there's errors, that's fine because you can do well on the other two um, criteria and that will give you a higher score as well. So again, focus on communication. That's great. That, that's a really good question. Okay. Um, this recorded, will this recorded, will this, uh, will this recorded session be shared with us through our registered emails? I have to ask the other panelists. Um, uh, can, can Rizki or Intan, can you let me know if that's going to happen? Will they actually uh, will be shared? I'm not sure. Um, sorry, Fauzi, I don't know the answer. I just, I, I just do the presentations. Mm. We'll share uh, the recording uh, into our website. So um. just stay tuned to our website. Okay, okay. So just check our website and then you'll be able to see it, yeah? All right, that's great, that's great, that's great. Okay, so, okay, we've got about five more minutes to go for questions. And we take us preparation partially in British Council for you listening. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. What is interesting about at least, okay, this is a bit of an ad. I apologize, but it's a bit of an ad. When it comes to British Council learning, what you do, it's, it's like buying uh, phone credits, yeah? So uh, for in British Council, let's say that um, you pay for, let's say 40 lessons, you pay for 40 lessons. And that 40 lessons, you can choose what to study. You can choose what to learn. That's what's great about uh, the, the way that we do things. It's called my class, Kristen. And, um, and what you do is basically, uh, you, there is, a, there is a, a website that you go to and you can look at all the lessons we have for the week and then you click, I want to book that one, I want to book that one, I want to book that one. And you can just focus on the stuff that you need. Yeah. So that is definitely something that we do at the teaching center. Um, Kristin, um, I'm sorry, I, I can't, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, Kristin Pajau. I'm sorry if I butchered that. But if you put your email in the chat away for us, no, actually we'll be able to figure it out. Yeah. We'll find, or just put your name in the chat or, um, and I'll get one of the uh, team from uh, my colleagues to email you to figure something out, yeah? Um, I think Hani's around and she might be able to help, uh, what do you call it? Connect you with um, some of our people at the teaching center. Okay. 
about some bird news that we do have really same with all British. I have no idea what you're talking, Mahmoudi. Um, I, I'm sorry, but could you could you just re rephrase that question? I'm not entirely sure um, what your question is, Mahmoudi. All right. So Firda has got a question. How can I know that I'm enough on learning general English until I can prepare my IELTS? Well, that goes back to the original thing at the beginning. Um, if you're, if you can, uh, if you need a 6.5 and you do a reading and listening practice test and you can consistently get a 27 or a 28, that means you're probably good enough. Uh, go focus on your IELTS. But if your reading and listening isn't good enough to get 95 to 100 percent in reading, listening, reading, and listening section one, uh, that's not enough. Okay, so Firda, hopefully that answers your question. All right. Ubaidillah. Okay, this is an interesting question. The difference between IELTS and TOEFL, they're basically the same type of test. They do the same thing. Uh, it's just IELTS is owned by British Council, um, Cambridge, and IDP, and TOEFL is owned by ETS, I think they're called, and they're accepted by different people. So um, basically, it's the same kind of test. It's just different people who, who give the test and different number of people who accept it. If I'm not mistaken, IELTS is accepted in about more than 80, I don't know, I don't know the numbers, but all I remember is that IELTS is accepted, is more accepted worldwide than TOEFL. For reading, you, oh yeah, yes, no, not given, true, false, not given. Pancha, I feel your pain, I feel your pain. Um, that so Punch is asking about yes, no, not given or true, false, uh, not given, um, and that is a difficult one. I would not be able to answer that fully today. That's uh, that's too long uh, to actually do that. We'll actually have to look at a practice test and give you that. So I'm sorry, Puncha, I can't really answer that uh, right now because we won't have time for that. Okay. Um, Christina's got an interesting question. Uh, okay, so the interviewer for the IELTS speaking, is, they are, there's no, it, they don't have to be a native speaker. There are lots of Indonesian people that I know who are also IELTS examiners, and there are people who are not Indonesian, uh, there are, yeah, th there's no requirement to be an, a native speaker, uh, to be an examiner, yeah. All right, okay, okay, that's an interesting question. And the language. Okay, I would recommend that you should use subtitles, Frenchy. Um, putting subtitles there, uh, it will help you catch things that you didn't catch with your ears. Um, I recommend using uh, recommend using subtitles, but if you feel comfortable enough that you don't need subtitles, don't use them. But what's interesting to note is that. Um, if you have the subtitles on, um, you will be able to better understand the pronunciation because English pronunciation and English spelling is so stupid, it makes no sense. Yeah? So I would always recommend using the subtitles because one, it, 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 it helps you catch everything that is spoken, that is said in the film or whatever, and it also helps you um, know how things are written. Yeah, because pronounce because spelling in English is, as you know, super weird. Okay, for writing and speaking, well, as I mentioned, okay, so Nisa has a question, an interesting question about how can you practice writing and speaking during the lockdown? Well, there are a few, okay, so you can do an online course, definitely, that's one thing, Nisa. Um, that's a good platform for it. Um, you can also um, find, uh, there are Facebook groups I know where people are speaking English, so they get together and they speak in English for a few hours a week, so that's one thing. Um, and there's one thing from Cambridge, yeah, uh, <laughs> English can be so weird, uh, write and improve, there's a, there's, a, this is by Cambridge, uh, writeandimprove.com. This is a good place to check your eye to check uh, to improve your writing. Um, it's free, but if you want to access the IELTS stuff, you have to pay. Yeah, 
So I recommend that for developing writing, for speaking, you need to find people who want to speak English and talk to them. All right, has to be, oh, that's a cool question. The average IELTS score of Indonesian people. This is interesting because I was just researching this last, uh, at the beginning of the year. Uh, 6.2, 6.1, 6.2 is the average. Um, you will be able to see this, um, Hasbi, you will be able to see this online. Uh, IELTS.org, they have a website which has, um, it has a breakdown of all of the uh, people who take IELTS all around the world and their respective averages. Um, I think Indonesian speakers, we're, uh, we're about at a 6.1, 6.2, I think. Okay, so Fauzi's got an interesting question. For a computer-based IELTS, how will it be conducted now that we have best me measurements? Okay, so we have something called IELTS indicator. Yeah, so the IELTS indicator is, uh, it's kind of like IELTS light. Um, I'm sure our, if you contact our exams team, they'll be able to get it to you. Um, what's, can someone help me with putting in the website for, um, what do you call it? Someone put me with a, can someone help me and just put in the website for um, our exams team um, so they can ask questions for the IELTS indicator straight to the people. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping a panel. Are, huh? Oh, that's a good question. That's a good point, Fauzi. Discord. Discord, yeah. If you want to improve your speaking, go play games. Uh, I recommend playing Minecraft, but that's just because I like playing Minecraft. <laughs> so yeah, finding a, 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 a Discord channel uh, would be really good for that. Um, finding a Minecraft server. There's a load of Minecraft servers based in East Asia where people are speaking English and it's, it's, it's really fantastic. I love that stuff. Uh, yeah, so thank you, Fauzi, for that really good uh, piece of input. Discord is a great piece of, uh, is, a, is a great app for that. Okay, Fetty's got an interesting question here. Uh, what if the total score is quite good, but my written test is only 5.5? That depends on the university. Some universities will, you know what? Even if you don't get a full, uh, you can get accepted to a university even if you have a lower IELTS score than they request. You can do that through um, something called pre-sessional courses. So I have friends who work in the UK and they work for universities at language uh, centers and universities. And what they do is they prepare students who were supposed to get a 6.5, but only got a six, for, let's say, uh, on their IELTS test. And they prepare the students a month to two months before the start of their course. So if your course starts in September, if you don't have the IELTS requirement, you could go two months earlier and join a pre-sessional, and then that means you can go up. Yeah, you can go up for there. Okay, all right. I think um, time is basically up. Oh, we've gone a little bit over, but um, let me just answer one more question. Uh, okay, so. All right, um, a lot of you are asking about how to develop, uh, how to know if you're good enough for your writing. You need to have, uh, that's why I don't recommend figuring that out by yourself. I said just listening and reading for, um, listening and reading for that, yeah? If you're focusing on writing and you need feedback on writing, you need a teacher. You need a teacher for writing to know whether or not um, your English, your, your writing is good enough. You need someone who actually understands the IELTS well enough to be able to give you good feedback. But um, one really interesting question by Reynaldi, and I think, I'm sorry, but this is gonna have to be the last question I answer. Um, in the speaking section, the topics are always unpredictable. So how do we solve this? You can't, you can't solve that problem. The only way you can solve that problem, right, is by improving your English generally so you can understand a lot of different topics. Yeah, let's say that, um, okay, um, let's say that in my IELTS, um, they asked me about how I like to stay fit and healthy. And I just say, look at me. Does it look like I try to stay fit and healthy? I don't, right? And then just uh, go on to talk about something uh, that's 
relevant, slightly relevant to it. Yeah. So you can't really solve that problem of having unpredictable um, topics on the uh, on the speaking. The only way you can do that is by developing your English well enough. Again, I keep saying this thing: develop your English well enough generally, so you can answer questions about basically anything with some confidence. Yeah. So. Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, but you can't really solve that. You just need to improve your English generally. All right, so um, thank you all for coming, and I apologize for not being able to answer all of your questions. Um, but before we go, um, I am just going to be putting a PDF. Oh, hang on. I'm going to put a PDF. Can I send this? Oh. Okay, okay. Um, we will be able to send out a PDF to you via email of the materials, uh, of, of not the, the, the presentation, but a, a, a quick document that um, you can read through uh, that has most of the information here. Okay, so again, thank you very much everyone for um, coming. And if you have uh, any further questions, I recommend going to uh, our Instagram at ID Learn English, and you'll be able to find uh, you'll be able to find someone to talk to about this kind of stuff there. All right. So again, thank you very much, everyone. Um, and may ah, you're from Bali, Fauzi. All right. Awesome. 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 Um, man, I want to go back to Bali now. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, uh, and I apologize for not answering some of your questions. I know that you had a lot, but we didn't have time. Um, and um, may you have a wonderful weekend. Bye, everyone.